Another way to put silver into perspective is to see how far the market has come since I first got involved in silver in 2005. When I first got involved in silver, the country was in love with real estate. I saw former car salesmen that could not sell a car all of a sudden make a quarter million dollars doing mortgages. Money and debt were flowing and the times were really good. I questioned what caused these good times, and the answer scared me. I learned that money was debt, and our debt was money. Our debt-based monetary system is one that must create more debt than the debt and interest accrued the year before it. If it does not happen, it will collapse upon itself in the mother of all margin calls. I also learned that if we paid off all the debt in the world, there literally would be no money, and we would still not have enough money to pay off the interest that was accrued on the debt. Once I saw these simple but powerful facts, I wanted to get out while the getting was good. The problem for me was that there was no obvious choice. I knew that if the dollar collapsed, stocks, bonds, real estate, annuities, CDs, and just about every other paper asset suffered the same fundamental flaw, that they were built on counterparty risk and debt. I finally stumbled across gold and silver. There seemed to be so little information on precious metals in a sea of paper pushers and very few had anything to say about silver, much less being positive. Back then there were only a few voices that were really understood the silver market. Not only did I educate myself on silver, I took action. I literally bet my house on silver. I did this while my wife was pregnant with our first child and everybody in the world calling me a fool to, for selling my house. We know the rest of the story where the housing and the silver markets have gone since then. The thing that I find amazing is how far we've come in the silver market since 2005. This is not about silver going up 400%, it's about the total investment environment. Let's look at how the silver market has changed since then. In 2005, the United States was the undisputed hyperpower. Now there is talk of currency collapse, and this gets people starting to think about leaving the dollar. In 2005, the dollar was the world reserve currency. Now major nations like Japan and China have dumped the dollar in bilateral trade. There is even talks of the BRICS nations forming their own IMF, own currency markets, and own stock markets. In 2005, gold was seen as a barbarous relic and silver was just an industrial commodity. Now gold is the rising de facto world currency beating out every other paper currency out there. And silver is returning to its status back into a real precious metal. In 2005, we had gold and silver sell off almost every month on rumors of western central banks selling gold into the market. Now we have massive central bank buying of gold, like Mexico and China. In 2005, we had Asia trying to gorge themselves on as many dollars as that they could get their hands on. Now they've officially said enough is enough, and they're buying real tangible assets. In 2005, China was once the largest exporter of silver. Now they're the largest importer of silver. In 2005, we had mining companies hedging their future mining production into the market. Now no one is doing that. In fact, there's now starting to hold silver as a reserve asset off of the market. In 2005, we had mining companies at the mercy of Wall Street to get financing, who then shorted their shares. While this may still be going on, it is nowhere what it was back then. In 2005, people trusted Wall Street and Washington, supporting the debt and wars. Now people despise the game and want out. In 2005, we did not have ETFs much less any institutional interest in precious metals. Now we have Eric Sprott's PSLV, the very large SLV, and the likes of the University of Texas buying $1 billion worth of physical gold. In 2005, you had to dig for information on silver, only to find some articles written a couple months ago. Now everyone and the brother has a blog about silver, with all the latest action and updates. In 2005, the United States Mint sold 8.5 million ounces of silver, valued at more than $63 million during the whole year. Now we have 6.1 million ounces sold in the first month of 2012, with an estimated value of $200 million. In 2005, the total United States silver production was 40 million ounces of silver, of which 8.5 million ounces, or 20%, went to Silver Eagle production. In 2011, the U.S. silver production was only 35 million ounces, and the United States Mint sold 40 million ounces of silver, or 114% of every ounce that was mined in the United States. In 2005, the U.S. Mint sold 444,000 ounces of gold at $440 an ounce, which is about $195 million. They sold $63 million in Silver Eagles, a 3 to 1 dollar invested ratio. 
In January 2011, the United States Mint sold 133,500 ounces of gold at $1,400 an ounce, which is about $186 million of gold. That same month, they sold $200 million of silver eagles at a 1 to 1 dollar invested ratio. In 2005, the United States Mint sold 8.5 million ounces of silver and 440,000 ounces of gold. There were 19 times more physical silver sold than gold. Now in January, there's close to 50 times more physical ounces of silver sold than gold. Does anyone doubt with all this relative demand for silver over gold that the gold and silver ratio should not collapse? In 2005, $7 silver was only 14% of its nominal all-time high of $50, and $440 gold was at 51% of its nominal all-time high of $850. Now $31 silver is only 62% of its nominal all-time high, and $1,650 gold is 194% of its old all-time nominal high. And just as a reminder, these are nominal numbers and not adjusted for real inflation. In 2005, there was no such thing as Too Big to Fail, TARP, TALF, QE1 or 2, Operation Twist, LTRO, Sovereign Debt Crisis, etc. And now it seems like there's a new one every month. In 2005, there were no survival or prepper shows. There was no Occupy Wall Street or Tea Party. There was no Ron Paul or even talk about constitutional money. In 2005, the Federal Reserve did not do interviews, and Blythe Masters was still cooking up credit default swaps. In 2005, the total derivative market was only $250 trillion. Now it is estimated to be as high as $1.3 quadrillion. In 2005, unemployment was rare and short. Now it is pervasive. In 2005, we had asset inflation. Now we have necessity inflation. In 2005, there was no states talking about gold and silver legal tender laws. Now we have Utah leading the way for 12 other states. These are just some of the major changes that come to mind in my seven short years in this market, and it seems we've come a long way. The truth of the matter is that we still have a long way to go. This will not end until the dollar is dead, the deficits corrected, and a massive paradigm shift in everything that we know. I used to sweat about 20 cent moves when silver was $7. Now that looks ridiculous. When this secular bull market is over, $35 silver is going to look like the biggest no-brainer in history. When I look back at my initial investment in silver, I may have been 7 years too early, but I knew that I did not want to be one day too late. And judging by the relative performance of silver, next to just about every other asset out there, it's been a good ride so far, and I'm looking for a strong finish.